So we all know about Casulana. It is a lovely machine. It is nice and fast. Uh, some of the following I apologize for before we get there. It is scripts that were written by other people 15 years ago and have been um, organically, well, they've been evolving ever since, should we say. Right. The home directory for the Debian CD user has a bit of a clue or here already. Readme.release actually documents most of what I'm about to describe anyway. So if you do need um, a, a refresher and I'm not around and whatever, by all means go and have a look at this file anyway. This is what we do on a release day. Um, it, this will, that will gloss over some of the details of what I'm about to describe because you don't normally need to know it. It's only when you're hacking on things. Uh, so, you will see on the screen there are quite a lot of symlinks into, a git, into various git direct, directories under the git tree. Um, deliberately, this is to make life easier when people are building and whatever. We have one, one single central set of git repositories checked out and then things point to various parts of it. It's, again, it goes back to how we've done things in the past. It's easier for people to track. I, need, I know if I'm going to do a buster build, I cd into build.buster and go from there. In here, there are various conf.sh files. Um, these are Debian CD config. Um, they are all very, very similar. We actually tend to keep them around, keep them around together. The conf.sh dot something is a common pattern that I try to use. The dot something on the end will deter it is something that you supply on the command line later to tell it I want this specific build. Um, it means that, for example, doing DI alpha releases, beta releases, and whatever becomes quite easy. I'll show you in a moment what's in the config files. The, then the top level scripts, ftp.cron is a cron job that runs every five minutes on Casulana. This is the job that starts the daily and weekly builds. Um, yes, it would be much cleaner if it was run, if it was triggered via SSH, but at that point we then end up with um, cross security domain traffic and whatever. It's actually easier. This will check every five minutes and see if the timestamp on the archive on, on this machine has changed. If it has, it will do a build. Um, ignore the horrible shell. The actual logic is down here. We work out for a daily what the next build number should be. For a weekly, down the bottom, we check to see if it's a Monday and if it's the first time the archive has changed. So the weekly build day is always Monday, it just is. Of course, I can run these manually, but that's how it triggers. Ah, and finally at the end, the most recent addition, um, once this is finished, if we've actually done a build, we will sync across the log files from what we've done over to a static CD Builder logs vhost elsewhere. Um, so various people in the past have shown interest in the log file output of Debian CD. I don't know if they even do anymore, but we still sync the logs in case. Um, so the, the two cron jobs, the, so the, the top level cron job, depending on the day, will call cronjob.daily or cronjob.weekly. Cronjob.daily basically sets up a whole load of variables at the top. It, this is more config than script. Um, we then work through a list for arch in arches, do stuff, and there's a whole load of conditionals depending on what things we want to build. But fundamentally, the core thing that matters is there are multiple standards calling testing CDs with a whole load of configuration. 
Um, some of it, the, the only thing testing CDs cares about as an actual command line, again, this is a horrible style of script, but it, this is the way it's grown. And it, I've been rubbish about updating this and documenting it and everything. The only thing that testing CDs takes as an argument is the architectures that you want for this build. Not the set of architectures for your entire build, but the individual architectures you're doing in this individual CD image set. So, for example, this particular one, if you notice, does AMD64 and i386 because we're doing Arch Multi-Arch. Um, it sets up the rest of the parameters. Conf.sure sets up a base and then we override them with a whole load of extra settings here. These are all configurations to the underlying Debian CD code. I hope everyone's following. None of this is hard. I'm just more and more embarrassed the further we get through this that it, it is messy. I have no, you know, no, no qualms about admitting that. Um, so the specific set of options that we've run here hopefully are mostly self-explanatory. You know, for example, on the netinst, we don't include release notes. We don't include the installation manual because we want a small image. The code in Debian, there's code inside Debian CD that knows if we don't have the installation manual on the image, instead modify the readme in the root of the disk to link to the one online, that kind of thing. It all falls through. No recommends, no suggests. Again, if, you, if, you're not, if that isn't obvious, please shout. Um, complete equals zero means we are not looking at every package in the archive. We are just going to take what is specified in the task package. The task package determines what set of packages go on the media. Debian installer plus kernel is what, is what actually makes a netinst a netinst. So it has DI plus the kernel. Woo, who'd have thought? Um, if you just want what we used to do, a business card image, in fact, we didn't have all of DI on the image either, and it would have to go and grab bits. We didn't have the base system, it would have to go and grab bits. Um, DI, Debian installer plus kernel here is a task. I will come to tasks later. Uh, max ISOs, max jig do's, determines what our output format is going to be. Um, we can build ISO images, we can build Jigdo images. Do people aware what Jigdo is? Um, for netinsts, we always do both. For certain of our image formats, and I'll come to that in a moment, we don't. Um, we also specify here what else we do in terms of which version of DI we're using and all that. This script has support for building both testing and SID versions of things. We do, a, we do a mix. We don't always do the full set because it just hasn't been useful in a long time. So be aware there's a lot of script. A lot of this is actually not run. It's actually conditionaled out. So that is the multi-arch ones. We then have a list of the individual architectures. And again, it's exactly the same thing. It's just we're passing in an individual architecture. We then have our special Mac-only builds, which need a slightly different set of config. Again, these are all basically inheriting the same base config, but we're specifying specifically boot method equals BIOS only. There was so much conditional stuff available in Debian CD to support lots of different variations on images. Then there's the stuff I've just been working on literally in the last week with Holger to add Debian Edu variants of the NetInst. Um, and again, you can see it's just a lot of conditionals, so you can turn these builds off if you don't want them. And then a whole set of here is config to describe how things should be run. Now, the thing I haven't explained, has anybody been, not been noticing that each of these scripts is run with an ampersand on the end? That, that is one of the reasons why this is a nested set of scripts, is so that we, we can make the most of our, our, of our humongous big 88-core machine with all of the I.O. in the world and all the memory in the world, we actually don't want to be running one build at a time. Um, did I just wander off, Mike? Oh, it is. It's, yeah, I saw you had it earlier, didn't you? 
Sure. Um, so, right at the t so as part of each of these builds, there is a macro. So there's not a macro. There's a shell function called build started, and we specify a build name for each of these. This is my, my own grotty, um, again, not particularly well documented because it works for me, way of starting a whole load of builds in parallel. Where these days when we build the daily set for AMD64 i386, we have about eight variants. They all build in parallel. By building in parallel, we actually benefit hu hugely because of the, the file caching and directory caching, most of the input data is identical from one image to the next. So we can gain a lot. We can build eight images in the time that it would take to maybe do four if we were doing them, in, doing them serially. Um, to be honest, on Kajulano, it's actually much faster than that. It's probably we can do eight in the time of two because, of course, we're not seeking any more. Like we, you know, it's all SSD. So at the bottom of this, of that loop is the magic catch parallel builds. I'm not going to show you the gory details. It will sit there in a loop every few seconds checking, have all of the builds that were started or any of them still running. If they are, wait. Once they're all finished, it then checks for the error that came back. Then it deals with actually building and for each architecture because we build an architecture at a time in parallel. It then goes and deals with catching the results. Finalize Archder. This is where we actually grab all of the different outputs from all of those parallel calls, and we, we stick them into one directory tree. We, we make sure all the JDOs are together, all the ISOs are together. We generate the checksums for them, all of that. So we parallelize as much as possible during the individual build process, and then we stick it all to get together at the end. Um, you will see there are various extra um, script helpers. If you want to see each of the script helpers, I'll go through it. Most of them are fairly obvious. There are comments in line. This is, as I said, this has grown organically, and so things have been refactored as I've found it makes help make sense. So that is cronjob.daily. Um, once we have done the, we've collected all the bits together, we make sure we remove any of the older ones, we only keep a few dailies around at a time. We then put them into place in our output directory. There are, there's a lot of moving files around and whatever to, because we then finally sync things over to Peterson, which is where we publish. So this is where all of the data goes from Kajulana sat in Iraq in the UK. Um, we sync across the, the, date, the actual output data for publishing goes to Peterson in Sweden. Peterson used to be the build machine, as I'm sure most people know. Um, for now, until we end up replacing it, um, it's still the, the target machine for pushing to and then copying on to the huge big publishing machinery that the uh, that University of Uvamea host for us. Um, in fact, not just host, but provide for us. I, I'm astonished at how good they are to us. Um, so there is an individual bits and pieces that we are sync. Deliberately, I exclude ISOs when I'm pushing to Peterson because we have jig dues for all of the builds. Peterson on the other end, I can tell it with the publish on Peterson script. It knows how to then convert back from jig dues to ISOs using its copy of the mirror. So instead of copying potentially terabytes of ISO images, we can copy, we can actually send over less than 1% of that data and get a huge, a huge big win on performance. Although the machines are both have really good net connections, Still, there's no need to copy a terabyte for no reason. So, that's the daily bit script. It takes currently about 20 minutes end to end. Um, as I said, it runs each architecture in parallel. I count 
I think, 11 architectures, including a multi our definition of multi-arch, which is the AMD64, i386 together on the same image. That's the daily script, which runs twice a day. <laughs> of course. It used to be daily, but then we changed the archive sync to be more than once, the archive pusher to be more than once per day. We actually then went to four per day. It is pointless for us to build CD images four times daily because not enough is changing. So we deliberately, so in fact, at the top of, no, not here, in ftp.com, there was logic to work out which daily, but which builds on which build we should be doing a daily out of the pushes that we've seen. I hope that makes sense. So, cronjob.weekly, guess how often that runs? Every day. <laughs> Once a week on a Monday. I said on the first sit, the first mirror push that Casualana sees on a Monday morning, it will do a weekly build. It will then do the daily build straight after it, but the weekly one is, to be honest, is the more, more interesting build. And so I did the daily one first because there's less of it. The weekly one is similar in style, but there's a lot more to follow. So again, there's a lot of variable setup and whatever at the top. So you notice earlier I mentioned about conf.sh.whatever. If I specify release build equals foo, then various of these things will trigger to say, instead of um, using a generic conf.sha, we will use the specified conf.sha.foo. And also, because it's a release build, we will not automatically sign with the testing CDs key. It will instead generate everything and put it into a temporary holding directory on output for me to then go and say, now we grab them, we test them, and then I sign them with the official Debian CD release key. Um, so there were various conditionals through here where behavior is almost identical. There's just a couple of changes in the flow, which are exactly related to how we describe the images and what happens to them at the end. So again, lots and lots of variable stuff. Um, oh, each time we pull this, we run these, it will CD into the Debian, direct, Debian CD directory, which is work, working code is, and it will pull it. We run directly from Git um, because, although we package Debian CD and we encourage people to use it that way, for our purposes, there is always changes going on, particularly in the testing code, which is what we're looking at today. For the release branches, once we get the, say, for Jesse and for Stretch, you, you'll see, I don't know if you noticed, we had a build.jesse, a build.stretch. The code in there is also get pulled, but that is on a specific Debian CD branch, which only ever sees, obviously, uh, very well curated changes. They're just fixes that we find after we've done a release. So, there is a whole set of images here. Again, for arch in arches, we have, a, you know, is the top loop. There is a whole load of setup. So we have a full DVD set. Again, this is all configuration to describe that set. For i386 and AMD64, we make three ISO images. We make Jigdo images for the whole set. Specifically, for DVD1, we say the size of it is four gigabytes, so it'll fit on a USB stick. Um, I think that's a cute thing to do. It, you know, it means that we don't need, you know, that we don't not fit. For source, we explicitly build a full set of ISOs because we want it to be easy for people to download our complete source. Um, this was a, a special config that we ha had a discussion about with people a few years ago, and you know what? Sold. For yeah? Um, what does Max ISO 3 do? That means that we will build, the f we will build at most three ISO images. We will build more um, images available, but we'll only actually make dot ISOs of the first three. And how do you specify what goes in the first three versus not? Um, that is part of Debian CD. I'll, I'll be coming to it in a more, more generically later. Okay. So, but basically, it's sorted 
the things, the tasks that you specify for a full set go on first, then the rest of it is sorted using popcorn. So the stuff that goes in the first image, to be honest, we're struggling to make even what we want to go in fit in that first DVD image. So you might need the first two or three, but you will get all of your desktop bits, you'll get um, all of the core things that frankly make it a Debian system. If you want to get obscure things from Debian science or from you know, JavaScript development or whatever, you're going to be somewhere down on DVD 11. You're not going to be able to download an ISO image from us because we don't care. You know, there were not enough people wanting it for it to be worth us mirroring the full set of ISOs for that. That's a decision we've taken and most people understand. Um, so, specifically for PowerPC and ARM64, again, they can, uh, we can put the same image on a USB key as you would write to a DVD. So we make the first DVD fit in 4 gig. You will notice that for, apart from the x86 architectures, we only do max ISOs equals one. Um, so few people are ever going to be caring about grabbing the later DVD ISO images um, that, we, again, we, we don't see any point in making them. These are all changeable. It's, you can see it's all config. It's quite easy to fix up in here. So, specifically, if I just sounds like yeah okay so specifically we specify the task for the DVD is Debian all I will go through tasks later Debian all is all of the desktops followed by the popcorn data um, we also have a single DVD with firmware image and at that point so we built we start another build with force firmware turned on and a different name for the image, but everything else is the same. So, that's the DVDs. We have a full Blu-ray image set, where we specify, I should explain, max package size is the maximum size of a binary package that we will attempt to fit in the images. It didn't used to be an issue until people started dumping a gigabyte and a half of game data into a single package. The first time Debian CD saw that and we were still making CD images, um, it ran for about a day and a half and I hadn't spotted because I was doing other things. And I was wondering, why, haven't, why hasn't the weekly build turned up this week? It had gone up to CD image 2345 attempting to fit this into that size image and incrementing hoping it would fit the next one. It wasn't great. So we set a maximum package size for the various different images. You didn't see this before on the dailies because we never install any really large packages in the dailies. For the full sets, we set a maximum package size to make sure that things fit. In fact, there you go. You can see the same thing is for the DVD. I just glossed over it earlier. On the Blu-ray, again, we allow a really large package size. If anybody does come up with a... 50 gigabyte package, they'll break every tool in Debian, but they'll also cause issues in Debian CD. So, explicitly, we only generate Blu-ray images for those architectures. Um, Debian CD treats source ma mainly as just another architecture because it's easier that way. This is not how it used to work, but ignore history. We don't generate any ISO images because I don't think anyone should be downloading a 25 gigabyte file over HTTP unless it's on their local network. You know, the chances of it getting down to the far end in one piece without retries is essentially zero. Um, we do create jig -dos of all of it. We do specify that all of the desktops will be on there. So this means, again, this comes down to how tasks work later. And then we generate, we start an yet another backgrounded task to build the Blu-ray set. We also have full dual-layer Blu-ray set. Once, we did actually manage to have a single disc which would hold all of our M64. That was about three releases back and it's gone away now. <laughs> we also build then the individual desktop CD for XFCE only. We used to do a whole set, one for every desktop. 
Um, most of the desktops don't fit on a single CD anymore. It's just frustrating. I, I was actually, I actually killed this altogether until a lot of people said, oh, please, can we have a single CD? Fine, here, I've picked one. You're never going to get no mono CD anymore. As part of the weekly build, we also build a netinst image, or in fact, all, a full set of the netinsts. We didn't used to, but it actually makes life easier. The weekly build includes the small set, the small images too. Is the microphone just dying too much? No. Okay. Okay, sorry, just picking the microphone. Ugh. I have a lot of sympathy with that point of view, but there are a lot of people out there who still need um, offline installation media. It's reducing, absolutely. Um, but especially considering in the past, before I killed them, a full set of CDs, we were up to 85. No one was ever going to write more than the first two or three. Um, so that's why we killed that. For DVDs, it's similar. Um, but I personally have sold sets of, sets of DVDs to people who actually want them, sometimes for their own archiving purposes. It's uh, meh. If you're at the stage where you're trying to feed a dozen or more bits of insulation media into your computer, I, th I don't think that's a great experience. So, we also build all the net insts as well as part of the weekly build. Um, this is mainly for my convenience. It used to be at the end of a release build, we would have a set of DVDs in one output directory, a set of CDs in another output directory, and potentially others, and then on release day, I'm then juggling to merge those. That is, was and still is to a certain extent, a manual step where mistakes happen, so I don't want it anymore. This is, so that's why this is here. Blah, blah, blah. So again, you can see all the same code in cronjob.daily is basically here again. We've got the multi-arch builds. And again, at the end of this, you see, look, catch parallel builds. For the weekly images, even more so than the daily set, um, now we've got multiple Debian edges, literally just added in the last week. I think we're up to 11, maybe 12 parallel builds going on for the x86 architectures. Um, Casulana is a monster machine and doesn't even notice. It's running at a load of 12 or so. And you know what? Who cares? It's fine. Um, the key thing is, you know, I, I, I don't have to live in the machine to hear what used to be Peterson. I, I spoke to Mazavan and he said yes. He could tell when it was a build day because all the lights on the disc on the front would go, would, you know, would go crazy. And you could hear the heads moving, apparently. <laughs> you know, it really was thrashing the bollocks off it. On, on Casulana, it's probably, of course, it's silent apart, apart from the CPU fan. But still, we are thrashing it. This Debian CD on this, but this type of build is about the most I/O and CPU intensive thing I'm aware of, um, so which is why I spent a lot of time actually tuning this and benchmarking what a good setup was back in Heidelberg. So finally, end of this, we generate a set of checksums files for the outputs. Um, if it's not a release build, we sign using the automatic testing key. Um, things get, we check for errors in, in the build, blah, blah, blah. We generate our firmware images. The firmware images here are not the CDs with firmware included. These are the extra tarballs and whatever that you can download separately to go and stick onto your a separate USB key. I'm, I'm very tempted to kill these because nobody can ever make these work. The number of times that we get people complaining, I don't understand how this works and I can't make it happen, it's a nightmare for user experience. So then at the bottom, we find we put sync to Peterson. We also sync CD sources. I'll come back to that in a moment. We also push to Peterson to make to make it to have it make snapshots for us. Again, I'll come back to it. Now, I did skip over at the top. There is something at the bottom here for catch live builds. Right up at the top of the script, 
there is, it also triggers in parallel a separate cronjob.weekly live. That's where the live images and the OpenStack images happen. It is not going to be that way for much longer because we desperately, desperately need to disentangle some of these. The reason for merging all of this and having it all controlled by one big script of doom at the top was to make it man manageable on release day. Um, I've had enough of trying to manage three different types of image from the same script. It's going to go away. So I did mention at the bottom here, we publish CD sources. One of the things that came out back in the Sarge days was that Debian CD, as part of its build, needs to extract various things from some binary packages to go on the CDs. Not the packages, but it needs bits of Syslinux to make them bootable, for example, or it needs bits of Grub. Um, we didn't actually do this well for a very long time, Debian CD. We actually had our own copies of Syslinux binaries in the Debian CD package, which was frankly broken. Um, we realized that after a while because it caused us problems. It also meant that we, we'd lost track of where the source was. You know, we were not good people. We fixed it. What this does is part of the Debian CD build, it now knows I am extracting a package from this from this binary and it keeps some metadata to list the binary and source packages where that came from and it sticks the files in, or it's, it copies those files, the, the binary packages and the source packages into a CD sources directory as part of its build so then we at least have an archive of all of the sources and all of the binary packages we have ever borrowed bits from also are kept for posterity. Um, it's slightly wasteful of space. Of course, from one run to the next, we're copying the same files over every time because they're the same package versions. It's not huge. We also generate the snapshots. This is less of an issue now that Weasel's awesome snapshot.debian.org thing works. But of course, years and years ago before that happened, for our, for our Jigdo images to work and for, to, for them to continue to work after the archive has moved on, we need a full back mirror where Jigdo can go and find the packages it needs. Um, we, jet, we have a snapshot on Peterson, which is, which is exposed publicly. We also have a snapshot on the UK Debian mirror, um, which is exposed publicly through, a, through a, uh, an alias in the DNS. I'll come, again, like in many things I keep on saying today, I'll come back to that in a bit. But basically, we generate the snapshots. Finally, at the end, we, we update our trace files. This is what triggers various mirroring things to happen, and we're done. Uh, where are we? So, Cronjob Weekly Live will be, the actual code here will, won't be familiar, but what it does will be familiar to people in the cloud team. Because basically, it sets up various things and then it calls into one open stack or where were we? Or run live. Each of those runs a, a VM and causes things to happen inside it, just the same way that I've that you know I, that um, we do things for building cloud images, just not in as good or as controlled a manner. I will be moving this VM setup over to the stuff that Luke has come up with. So we have disposable VMs rather than long-running stuff. <coughs> okay, is this going? It's not complaining about battery low or anything, of course. Okay. Oh, wow, it's warm up here.
Right. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. Right. So Debian CD. Um, again, this is all. This is in the archive. We don't use the copy in the archive, but it is updated fairly frequently. Um, top level script is build.sha. You see, it wants a conf.sha. If you don't, if you don't pass one, it will go and find one in its in its current directory. Um, it's just a set of configuration in shell. So it just sets up a whole load of variables. So you can specify, do you, you know, the code name of your image, do you want backports, you can tell it where to go and get DI if you want, you can say whether, it, whether the images you're building are official or not. Only people running this on Debian machines are allowed to call these things official. We have a made a point of, t of saying that. Um, it sets up a whole load of working variables. You tell it where the mirror is, where your temporary directory for building is going to be. This is boring stuff. It, 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 there's very little external documentation, but every variable that matters is, doc is commented in here. Um, including things like we have a whole range of different possible sizes we can support. Um, so. The more useful stuff is in the make file underneath here. We have a whole load of things that it sets up. The key thing is we set up tasks. Debian CD itself comes with a set of core unchanging tasks, which are basically a task to us, it's just a set, a set of, uh, it's a meta package, not necessarily the same as the tasks that we know of in the archive and DI uses, but a task for me, and I'll show you one, I mentioned Debian all earlier, it is literally a it's, a, it's a container. This is all expanded at one time using CPP. So we can have the Debian installer plus kernel task always goes first on every image because you know, an image set that doesn't have the installer on, it's not an installer image, you know, obviously. We have specific things that we recommend should be on the first image called 4CD1. I'll show you that in a minute if you're interested. We have what we consider to be the, the, the essential tasks. Then we go to the, the full tasks, and these are generated. I'll come to it in a moment. We then have a set of other interesting packages that we think should, might be near the beginning of the set. This is almost a null set these days. Finally, we include the popularity contest. Now that, at, at one time, we, gen we go and talk to popcon.debian.org and download current pop popcon data, and we then use that to feed into our sorted to, to a sorted list. So anything that's not already included in one of the earlier tasks will then be pulled in through popcon. So again, deliberately, if you have something that only two people have ever installed and one, one of them isn't using it anymore, it will still make the, set the, the full DVD or Blu-ray image set, but it'll be right down the bottom. Um, the, the, at build time... What, what is parsing um, it's, it's run, it's passed through CPP, um, which, so deliberately, well, if it looks like it's CPP, it is. Um, so we can then have recursive includes. I'm going to show you one of the other tasks. For example, Debian Edu Full. Is, you can see it doesn't have all of the, all of the stuff that I just showed you in the Debian All. And the Tasks Buster Popularity Contest, this is auto-updated, auto um, but we include the most recent copy directly in the Debian CD source. So you can do a Debian CD build without being online. And so you can see, libbz2 is apparently quite common. 
Any guesses for what might be at the bottom of the list? Um, so the task, the sorting that we then do with these, um, we have the input list. We then pass it through our own sort dependencies um, script. So you don't have to list every package. All of the dependencies for your given package will be pulled in if they're needed. So that way we can just list um, the task packages that matter. So we can list, for example, the task in here. We can list, say for the, the XFCE image, that just lists task essential XFCE. That will get expanded at one time later to pull in everything that is depended on by task essential XFCE. This is how we do it. So in this particular case, you'll see this will pull in everything because it will pull in in popularity contest. But at one time when we build, we, you know, we build the XFCE image and say max ISO is equals one, max JIGDO is equals one. So the moment we get to the end of building the first image, we stop. No, we, no, well, no, we only build the first CD. We then stop doing it. We, we, we then don't build any more. Um, the max ISOs and max JIGDOs thing interact. So we will go, when we're actually laying out the CD images, we will go to the highest number that you have mentioned in either. And all is magic. It just means go to the end. Ah, where are we? So, in here... There's a whole load of data which is organized per release. This is mine, just daft little lists of the other specific UDEBs we need to include or exclude for various architectures. I'm not going to go through the data details of those because mostly, in fact, they're obsolete. A lot of these are very similar, they're tiny. Don't worry about details. The other important parts of, De of Debian CD are the tools boot directory, and this again varies by release. And there is a boot script here per architecture. This is where actually a shitload of magic happens, and I wish it wasn't. Um, all of the knowledge that I have picked up about how to do combined um, booting of um, AMD64 and i386 for both BIOS and UEFI on CD and on USB key is encoded in these scripts. So this is the magic place at the part at the beginning of each image in the set. Debian CD will call tools boot suite boot dash architecture um, with a CD number. For most of them, we don't care. If your CD number is higher than one, we just exit. For a lot of our architectures, we cannot build a bootable CD because they don't boot off CD, for example, or they don't boot off USB. That's a pain in the ass. For x86, for PPC, for ARM64, we do know how to make things bootable, so there is real stuff in here. Um, and these know where the things live inside the DI, inside DI to go and grab them, and then have a look at the details later if you want. I'm not going to cut to work all the way through this. But we do have lots of things down the bottom here where we work out, where we add. Uh, for example, on the x86 ones, we add the Win32 loader bits. It's all integrated here. We also add all of the SysLinux bits. And by God, is this a pain in the ass to do because it changed from one, from one week to the next at some point in the past. And you'll see there, there is a common thing here, add Makaizo FS opt. So all the while while we're going through all of these boot scripts, we are, we are doing work, copying files into place, and also appending things that, that are going to be run as part of the final Makaizo FS or now um, Zorizo command line in a specific order. So for example, 
you'll see here that we're adding, we're saying where the ISO Linux boot block is going to be, where the ISO Linux boot catalog is going to be, and various other bits and pieces. Actually building a CD image that works with all of the clever magic, you end up with a thousand characters in, in the, the command line. Generating that, doing it by hand is easy. If you want to do it with lots and lots of options, and you know, it's, it takes some, some work. Um, and I'm just skimming through. You know, we also have support in here for using a different splash image. So this is where the Debian Edu different graphic gets dropped in. We have to tweak the init RAMFS for it. Um, blah, blah, blah. We add Grub. We create a fat partition if we're doing EFI booting. I'm, I'm going on and on. There's, there's a lot of stuff here. But you don't need to know it most of the time because it should just be working. So we generate a list of all the packages that we're going to do. We then start laying out. We, we sort those packages. We then start laying out the image, temporary image trees. So on Casulana and on Peterson, the best way to do this is rather than copy all of those gigabytes of files, is we create trees of hard links in, into the archive. Now, this is the bit that causes DSA to forever, me to be forever chasing DSA every time we reboot the machine, say, please, will you let me create hard links? Um, it does create, it does save a vast amount of I.O. if we don't have to then make for 12 different types of image, 12 different copies of large chunks of the archive. It saves on disk space, it saves on I.O., it is a really big win. Um, so we work through, I have the script. Make disk trees. Guess what it does? It makes disk trees. It knows how big the size is that, uh, that you're meant to be creating. It works through the list of packages. It will check, it will guess how big the image tree is that you're currently working on. The point when it goes, gets close to the size that you've told it, it is the maximum for each for the image size you're working on. It will actually then call Zorizo and say, how big is this really? We, we guess because it's faster. Once we get close, we actually validate with a tool. We want to get as close to the maximum size as possible, but obviously we can't go over. The closer we get, obviously, we might end up with one fewer DVD image. And that is absolutely worth doing. If people are going to download a DVD image, they want to make sure we want to get, get as much Debian on it as we can. You know, I hope that all make, no, that's fairly obvious. So the script goes through and optimizes. It does not change the order of the packages because ordering it matters. We always make sure that the dependencies of package A are inserted in a list before package A. If we then went and changed the ordering here, you'd have things on the CD that you wouldn't be able to install. Um, so this is a big Perl script that just literally, it just iterates. It causes, again, huge amounts of I.O., making trees of hard links, and then calling Mikaizo FS to say, are, are you at the right size? It keeps going until actually it go, it's gone one package too far, and then it's gone over the size that's allowed. At that point, it knows I can't do that one and rolls back. Um, it's easier to do that than to guess. And, and so on. So this stuff also supports the multi-arch images. Uh, you know, as I said, we have had in the past, we don't any more multi-arch images, including source. And a constraint on that would, would have been even more so than does your package, you know, do your package dependencies fit on the media, the source for any given package would go on the media first too. So that way we could guarantee that if you gave out one of these multi-arch with source images, you were guaranteed to have the source for all the binaries. Um, that took a lot of effort. And it's a shame that I've had to turn it off because, well, unfortunately, um, a DVD just isn't big enough to have two architectures and source on it and actually get anything useful. So, that is the overview of the make disk trees. At the end of each time make disk trees comes to 
and it knows it's finished an image, it will go and start the next one. Once we've done that, we simply iterate through all the temporary trees and say, make me an image, make me an image, make me an image, make me an image. Um, or make me, a jig, make me a jig do and an ISO, make me a jig do and an ISO, make me a jig do, make me a jig do. Don't do all the ISOs. And then we get to the end of the run, and that's where we collect things together, as we saw earlier. Following me? Good, because I'm, this is obviously totally ad hoc. I haven't pre prepped this in any way. So I know I'm not doing a good job of describing ordering and how this, this plugs together. Once we get to a release day, um, a normal, the first major release is easy. I do cronjob.weekly. It gives me all the images. I go and grab those images from where they're in a temporary output directory on Peterson. We can go and grab them. We can go and test them. Um, the only time I'm ever prepared to put the official release signature on images is when they have had some manual QA as well. Um, I've been wanting to go back and plug in some automated QA into this process for as long as I've been doing it, and I'll admit I've been crap and there hasn't been enough time, there's always been more things needed, and the QA hasn't happened. Um, I will get to it, I promise. Um, once we have done the QA, um, and I'm happy, then at that point, on Peterson, again, not Kajulana, because that's where we're publishing, um, there will then a set of scripts to basically pull together all of the checksum files. Um, make a, I make a tarball of those, grab them down to my local machine for signing, and then push them back again. You know, obvious stuff. The key is not on one of the public machines. Um, on a non-major release, so on a point release, there is the added complication of the update images. Are people aware of those? No, I didn't think so. So it's probably not useful anymore because people don't have full CD sets. I'm tempted to actually start dropping these. Um, if you have a full set of DVDs of Debian 9.0, the last thing you want to do is when we 9.1 or 9.2 come out, go and, go and download and burn, or even worse, buy a full set of 12 DVDs each time. Um, Apt is awesome, it makes a lot of this easy. We can instead, however, create an extra image which just contains the things that are new since the last release. So that, and that's exactly what the update images are. So, so long as you feed, if you feed your whole set of update, uh, so your whole set of DVDs into App CD1, of course, it will then tell you feed, put in disk two, put in disk three. It can also quite happily deal with here are a set of newer packages. Um, which are on update DVD 1 or update DVD 2, and it can, it can happily use those two. So each time we do a point release, um, we build a set of images that just contain the changes between the dot zero and today's point release. So you can then just have, so if you're at 9.5 like we are today, in fact, I couldn't even tell you exactly how many there are. I think we're up to three, but let me check. No, we're currently up to two DVD updates. Um, so you can then just go and grab those afterwards. So there is an extra process that runs alongside the normal CD build which is, I first of all have to generate a list of all of the .debs, .dscs, of all of the contents of the archive that would normally go on to a CD or DVD. I generate a list of all of those, um, and I maintain that. We actually have a separate repo which contains all that metadata. So I can then track what we had in, in 950, 951, 952, and then from the, I can generate a diff and using that diff, I've got an extra script in Debian CD called update CD, which basically you feed that diff and it will give you a, a set of parallel images to go alongside. On a point release day, 
Sorry? Oh, God, yes. On a point release day, I do then need to merge those images and their checksums with the DVD build, it, you know, with the rest of the CD DVD builds. It's, again, something that I should merge better because it can be error prone. Um, Andy Simpkins normally is around at my place on release day and was horrified to see how much typing I was doing, just doing that bit at the end of the process once we've actually tested everything. Um, I've been rubbish because I can be because nobody else is doing this. I really desperately would like other people to dive in. A, to tell me how crap some of the code is, I know how it is, but also to really identify the points where actually somebody else would struggle to follow what's going on. Yeah. Uh, so if you, we have currently pass factor one, so if we lose you, we have big problems really sure. generating images generating quickly. Generating a complete set at the moment yeah. is hard for anybody but me. And I know that, and that's one of the reasons why this session is happening. Um, going back to Casulana, as I said, readme.release, and even those people not in the Debian CD group, if you're on Casulana, you could read this. It's publicly readable. It lists what happens. It says it has a script to follow, which is basically disable the automatic daily and weekly builds so you don't end up with Casulana trying to trigger a, a normal weekly build just at the point when you're trying to do something else on the machine, you know, obvious stuff. It's like we disabled cron on the Debian release when we're doing it, that kind of thing. Um, there's details here about snapshots. The primary snapshot that we point to is now snapshot.debian.org. As I said, it's awesome. I don't have to worry about it. Weasel does, and he's better than I am at managing some of this. That's why, he's, that's why he's in DSA, because he's, he, he's awesome. And I know this isn't being video for his benefit, but no, genuinely, I am in awe of how, of how good Weasel is for some of his stuff. The thing that nobody else could do, apart from me and Phil Hans at the moment, is do the secondary snapshot that is on the UK Debian mirror. Um, it's not critical anymore, um, but because the jig do's need that snapshot, I've been in long, for a very long time, I've been in the habit of maintaining three separate snapshots um, for redundancy. There is one on the Debian mirror in the UK. There is one on Peterson, as I mentioned earlier, which is not actually referred to by any of the jig do images, but it's there as a backup. I also have a third copy on my own home mirror. Um, because that way then I, I can know if a disk is dying I need to put one in. Between the three of those machines, um, I, I have periodically pulled and pushed things. We do occasionally lose things due to software bugs or whatever, or, we, for example, we did have a disk failure in the UK mirror not that long ago, and it did cause a few things to have turn up in lost and found, but this is not great. So that's why I keep redundancy. Um, what else? So here is the data about making the update images and how to release things. Oh, the other thing actually that nobody else could currently do right now is actually sign release images. Um, I have the, um, the CD release key in my, under my control. Adam Barrett has a copy of it, but at the moment he wouldn't know what to do with it. You know, so we do have another copy. Now the flip side of that is the actual CD release key is not as highly trusted as the main archive key. You know, things do not check this automatically at build time, so at boot time or anything. We haven't gone that far. So if we do need to bootstrap a new key, and I've done it a couple of times, it's literally just a case of get a few local DDs who trust me to sign it, and of course. Being one of the many cabals in Debian, the UK is really, really good for getting DPLs and release team and whatever who are around to sign, the key, to sign a key to give it some trust. But, it, you know, but still, I would like it to be easier for somebody else to do this. Um, so, and Jonathan and I were talking about this already last week. Um, 
I would be over the moon if the next time we do a point release, somebody else or somebody else's was also on Casulana and Pettersen with me. We can share a screen session so, we can, so I can show people exactly what's going on, which basically corresponds to the instructions you're looking at on screen. But of course, this was written by me by hand. The chances are I've missed a step or something's changed since. You know how that works. But I'd like to go through it at least once or twice with somebody false shadowing me so somebody else gets an idea of what's going on. Most of this on release day, it's a, I edit a couple of files to change config to say, here's a version number, go. And then the hardest part is actually testing the images coming out. Most of this is really, really trivial. The problems come out, of course, if you actually need to start going and fixing bugs in Debian DD, because sometimes it happens on release day, we find a certain scenario that we've never come across before due to some weird combination of packages. Or, for example, when we did a dedication. And we've done dedications before, but the new dedication file names were not exactly the ones we expected. And so on release day, it's a, oh, crap. Start again, tweak the code to actually cope with, you know, to cope with the new reality. It's how it happens. It's not great, but unfortunately, the thing I, I have found over a number of years is, as Debian CD in particular is one of the, is another completely independent implementation of tooling to handle the mirror, to handle the Debian archive, I find things that other people haven't because, of course, they've changed implementation and changed their tools. Um, it's, it's happened a few times that I find bugs in behavior. They're often not a problem, you know, I can tweak around it on the day. It's only ever happened a couple of times where, sorry, this breaks the build, we can't do it. And obviously, at the point when we've just hit go and pushed out to our mirrors to say Debian 9.6 is out, that's not a good time to say, guys, you did it wrong, can we go again? Yeah, so, questions? Thank you. Um, uh if we're going to begin using Castellana to build things for cloud and they're going to be triggered off of git commits and things yep. like that, we're going to need to refactor your monster script that does Abs a lot of parallelism yes, absolutely, totally. into jobs that can be run by a scheduler. Yes, Okay. absolutely, I'm well aware of that. Okay. This is state of the art at the moment. Second item on my to-do list for Debian stuff is refactor all of this into something that is more easily callable externally. How much dependency is there on the big collector at the end? Like, do you want all of the various arches built before you begin the copy over to Paris um, and all that oh, kind of stuff? Sorry, so I didn't say was. The way it works at the moment is each of the architectures is built as a lump. We then sync architecture A across to Peterson while architecture B is building on Casulana, you know, to parallelize deliberately. Right, but, you, but it's important to you that the entire lump of the architecture goes as, as one block. The, yes, I okay. prefer it that way. So, of course, for most of the images, we do a daily, where, of course, you only have one or two small images per architecture. It's much easier that way. Uh, for the weeklies, for me, it's a feature that, uh, that a set goes together because, of course, the checksums go together, that kind of thing. It's easier to, to build it in one lump. I'm not saying it can't be changed, at all, but um, I think it's a feature. Okay, so when we when we carve that monster script up into pieces, we'll need to think. It's about going that. to be a, a per architecture thing. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Maybe it's also good if you do the next point release to do a screencast, so that uh, for people that can. Sure. Okay, yeah. And definitely, oh, I record the TypeScript and whatever typically on a release day, so I can share those afterwards as well easily, yeah. And apparently we are out of time.